Hey y'all, it's Jennifer Farr Davis. And last week on the Armchair Adventure Book Club, um, we started with the 10 year anniversary edition of Becoming Odessa. And it was awesome. I really wanna thank uh, my friend Jay, who is Mooch in the book, and my friend Warren Doyle, who is Warren Doyle in the book, uh, for jumping on and participating in the webinar with us. And we had a lot of great questions and couldn't get to them all. So I thought that before this week's Armchair Adventure, where we get to interview Derek Lugo, who wrote The Unlikely Through Hiker, uh, the one thing I could do is go back and answer some of the questions we didn't get to from last week's session. There are some good ones, there are some tough ones. So here we go. Um, someone asked Warren about when he would have a book coming out or if he was interested in writing. And he's not, he's not here today, um, but I do know that he is working on something. He said he wanted to wait till he was older and no longer actively hiking and through hiking before he started his book. And it is a project that um, he began this winter. So I'm not sure it will, how long it will take him, but hopefully we will get some writing from Warren sometime in the future. All right, uh, someone asked uh, their teacher and they wanna know like favorite shorter trails. So for me in the Southeast, there's so many great short, they're still long, right? But there's so many great trails between like 30 and 500 miles. And uh, some of my favorite are the Art Loeb Trail. You can do it in a weekend, it's 30 miles. The Foothills Trail is amazing, it's 77 miles. It's in the upstate of South Carolina. South Carolina and North Carolina both have trails that run the length of the state. Uh, actually, that's the width, sorry, width of the state. Um, South Carolina is the Palmetto Trail. North Carolina is the Mountains to Sea Trail. That one's a little longer. The North Carolina Trail, Mountains to Sea Trail is 1,200 miles. The Bartram Trail is 100 miles. The Pinhoti Trail, which goes through Alabama and Georgia, is just over 300. The Allegheny Trail in West Virginia is just over 300. Um, Benton Mackay Trail, which is North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, it's right around 300. So you don't have to hike the AT. You don't have to go out west if you're from the East Coast. There are so many great regional shorter long trails that you can experience. Um, and that's sort of what I'm working on right now too, with young kids, it's good to stay closer to home. All right, uh, favorite piece of gear, shoes and socks, right? Like your feet are so important on the trail. So um, farm to feet socks are definitely my fave. And then I wear these awesome, very breathable, lightweight um, astral hiking shoes. The junctions are my favorite hiking shoes I've ever worn just because they dry very quickly. They are pretty durable. They don't wear out and they're super breathable. So I have less foot funk on the trail. Um, I also love my Sawyer water filter. So those are some favorites. Uh, someone asked, hiking gave me a riding life. So they say, so they assume. How has riding changed my hiking life? Ah, I feel like the two are definitely in a relationship. Um, I don't know how much they've changed one another. I don't know. So hiking, like I, I was um, a journaler. And so my book came from my journals of my first through hike. And I think uh, they both accentuate the experience. I'll just say that. I think writing really helps to preserve some of my hiking experience and helps me to process that. And I'm really grateful for it and helps me to share my experience. Um, but hiking on the other hand, a lot of times if I have writer's block or I'm looking for inspiration, just being outdoors and being on a trail is such a great place to sort of feel energized and inspired for coming home and working on an article or a book or whatever I have uh, on the docket. So yeah, they're both helpful to one another. Um, what's everyone's craziest animal encounter? I was charged by an emu in Australia and that was intense. <laughs> I was all by myself and had gotten engaged like two days before leaving for Perth. So I thought I was going to get pecked to death and that's what my fiance was going to tell everyone. But I survived. I, uh, I scared the emu off and um, continued down the trail. But I've had a few nightmares with Big Bird in them <laughs> since that. 
So I think I still have a weird thing with very, very tall birds. Um, someone asked Warren if he still hikes around Banner Elk. He's still around that area. He lives in between Mountain City and Damascus, Virginia. So that part of the Blue Ridge is still his home. You can still see him on trail, but you're more likely to see him if you go to a local contra dance. So if you wanna encounter Warren Doyle and see him gracefully move, um, it might be on the trail, but check out a contra dance. He'll probably be there. Someone asked what's my next project? Keeping my business afloat during COVID and Corona and uh, trying to be a good mom. Those are the main things. And then I try to backpack about two weeks a year. That keeps me sane. And my husband and I, we give each other two weeks a year for personal adventure. So this year, my plan was to do the Allegheny Trail and I was supposed to be on it today. And obviously everyone's life and plans have changed this year. So I'm still hoping to do that trail, but the dates will have to shift and we'll see when and how it works. Uh, someone asked if I had regrets with this guy who followed me on the trail for six or seven days and just kind of drove me crazy when I was 21. Yeah, my regret was that I didn't grow up um, in a culture that taught me how to be direct. I was not direct at 21. I was more worried about hurting this guy's feelings than being honest with him. And it led to really awkward, uncomfortable six days on the trail. But I'm also very grateful for that experience because my communication really improved on the trail and I learned how to set healthy boundaries for myself. And um, I feel like I'm a, I'm a much better um, communicator. And I also just learned, there's just so much duplicity growing up as a woman in the South. And I love, love the South. And I love being a woman. Like these are good things for me, except like culturally, um, it was just like put out there that it was more important to say nice things than to be honest. And I've just realized that it's way more kind it's way more nice to show people respect and to be truthful from the beginning than to be duplicitous and say things you don't mean. So that was a big life lesson that I learned on the trail. Thank you. Moved. Um, someone asked if this is Max Patch as the background. Yes. And she said she went on a hike with Blue Ridge Hiking Company last year. <laughs> And that when they were on Max Patch, this beautiful Southern bald, it was all socked in and cloudy and she didn't get to see it. So I'm sorry, it's really pretty. <laughs> I hope you can come back and see it again sometime. It is awesome. It's one of my favorite spots on the AT. Um, so apparently there was a, a seven-year-old girl who asked why, um, why we decided, the panelist and I decided to be hikers. I think we're all hikers. I think it's sort of our heritage as humans. For most of history, people have worked outside and used their bodies to move outdoors. And it's weird to me now that we don't always grow up doing it. So when I first started hiking, I think a big part of me was like, aha, like I've been missing this. This feels so natural. This feels like something that humans have done for a really long time and should do. And it feels now much less natural, even with a Max Hatch background, <laughs> to sit in front of screens all day and work. So I think everyone's got a little hiker in them. They just have to find it. Uh, okay, almost done. Ooh, okay. So here, man, this would have been interesting to hear from Warren and Joy Jay what they think, but this is probably the controversial question here. I didn't see it during the webinar, I promise. But they said, Actually, I said, someone quoted me, ah, never a good thing. Someone said, in chapter 10 of the book, you said, what would happen if the country suddenly went to war or an epidemic started? What would it mean for my hike, for me? Given that this is currently the case, what would have happened? Do you agree with some hikers continuing their hike despite the recommendations from the ATC? That is a good question. I... <laughs> I feel like there's no right answers when it comes to coronavirus and every situation is very unique and individual and it's really important to try to give each other grace. And I totally understand where the ATC is coming from and I respect their recommendation. 
right? I totally get it. And I was on the board of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. One thing I loved, and I can promise everyone, is that the board and the organization is made up of really, really intelligent people who are very talented and who love the trail. And the cool thing about being on the board is we would sit in a room and a lot of times we would disagree but do it in a really, really positive way. And then at the end we voted and whatever the decision was, it was like everyone got behind it because there were different voices and they were all heard and everyone at the end of the day what's, wants what's best for the trail and can respect and understand that the majority vote um, sets that decision or precedent. So I totally respect the ATC and where they're coming from in their recommendation and we've done everything personally i have not touched the at and we have property on it and i and i even like internally debate whether we can go and mow the yard there because the grass is crazy and i'm like oh i don't it's 40 minutes away May, i shouldn't drive there it's in a trail town and so we haven't touched the at um we've shut down all our business related to the at um and on the other hand, having a bunkhouse on the AT, I know that some, some people have no place else to go. Like some people are international or would legitimately be homeless or going back to really toxic home environments if they left the trail right now. And so federally, from a national park standpoint, the trail is not technically or legally closed. And there are still people out there. And some of them are just like, you know, Define recommendations and doing their own thing. And then some of them, like, it might be the best option they have, and they're trying in every way possible to limit their contact and exposure to anyone, any facility in any trail town. And I just think it's a hard time. And um, everyone needs some grace. So <laughs> that's my take. There you go. Okay. Um, how long after completing the trail did I begin writing Becoming Odessa? Well, I had all these journals. So it's like I wrote about the experience along the way, um, but within the first year after finishing the hike. So I hiked when I was 21 and by the time I was 22, no, sorry, I turned 22 on the trail. Basically by the time I was <laughs> A year, 12 months. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I had a manuscript. I had like turned my journals into a manuscript. But then it took several more years to uh, even try to get it published. And that really wasn't my goal when I wrote Becoming Odessa. I knew I was different. I knew the trail changed my life. And I wanted to record that for myself. And I thought, you know, if I ever have a daughter, one day I want her to be able to read about this experience. And that to me is what makes Becoming Odessa really special is I didn't write it necessarily for other people or an audience. And there's a real like honesty to it because of that. I was not nearly as self-aware as I was with some of my other um, books or writing for better and worst. But yeah, so I wrote it 14 years ago. It was published 10 years ago and people are still reading it. I cannot grow up. I'm still 21. Um, okay, how do you approach the transition from trail life back to regular life, especially mentally and emotionally? It's hard. I try to ease in. It's like the food thing, right? Like when you're on the trail, you just eat and eat and eat. And when you get off trail, it's not like you can go back to... 2000 calories a day, like your metabolism is still ramped up and you need more food. So you just kind of like ease back into it. And usually, you know, within a couple of weeks or a month, I have a normal diet post trail. Um, but it's like that, I think with sleep, with work, with relationships, the two things I really struggle with coming off a really long hike or even a shorter backpacking trip, pace of life and multitasking. It's really hard. Um, so just trying to set up my schedule in a way and um, communicate to the people who are closest to me in a way where I get the support I need coming off trail. But I've bounced on and off so many times now that it's a lot more organic and natural of a process. So um, yeah, again, Grace, don't be too hard on yourself and expect it to be different and challenging and try to have some tools and resources that can um, be empathetic and also help you during that season. Okay, one more, two more. For everyone, what's the hardest part of the AT? Um, and I mentioned bugs, loneliness, weather, terrain. I don't like being cold. 
That's the hardest part. When I'm cold, I'm unhappy. <laughs> so if the AT was over 60 degrees all the time, I would be really happy. It's head in that direction, <laughs> so, uh, which is not a good thing. But I, the cold is my Achilles heel on any trail. And then what's the best trail magic you've experienced? Can people provide trail magic from afar? If so, what can we do? Uh, yeah, trail magic, it's just an outpouring of kindness, gifts for people on a long journey. I think right now some of the most important things you can do for trail magic is to try to support the businesses and trail towns that support hikers um, without going there. So it's really hard. A lot of these small towns, they rely on hikers for their economy. And now with coronavirus, um, the hikers aren't coming and that's a good thing. It's to protect the towns, but it's either they're choosing between their health and their livelihood right now. And it's really hard. So if you need gear and can order it from an outfitter on the trail, um, if you, can oh here's a great this is great so when the trail pit opens up and when uh people are on it um again more people then like doing something like calling a cafe like um the smoky mountain diner is a great little diner in hot springs and i would i would say to them like hey i want to do trail magic but i live in wisconsin could i like um, pay you guys $50 to get sausage biscuits out for any hiker that passes through because they're right on the trail between 8 a.m. And, and 10 a.m. And so you're supporting the hikers, you're supporting the local business. I feel like things like that are really a win-win and the Smoky Mountain Diner is awesome. So when Hot Springs opens up, go there too and tell Gina we said hi. They're the best. Okay, those are the answers from last week's questions. Thanks for participating. And again, I hope you join us for Derek. He'll be with us Thursday at noon. And if you're interested in picking up a signed copy of Becoming Odessa, the 10th anniversary edition, then you can get it from blueridgehikingco.com or jenniferfardavis.com. And it is also newly available in audio. So if you're not sick of my voice after this Q&A on Zoom, then you can download the audio and listen to it there because I read through it. So y'all have a good day. Hang in there and hopefully we'll see you at our Armchair Adventure Book Club on Thursday.